America Bierstrom. I'm the ag agent here in Kiwani County. I have a background in market animals, uh, but I do mostly work with dairy cattle and dairy producers. So that's where my background comes from. So the first thing that we would like to talk about a little bit here is trying to change that vocabulary with what we would call a market cow, what we want to call a market cow now, we always consider them being a, a cull cow. And a cull cow is something or something that we call is something that is, you're removing them by slaughter, it's probably a sick or weak individual, it has a negative connotation, and it's kind of something we discard. But what we're trying to move towards is marketing an animal, something that is offered for sale, it has potential, and we want to look at these cows that are leaving the herd as something with potential and not something we're just getting rid of. We have good market cows in the dairy. They have value. They are an asset to you and they contribute to the farm income. Dairy farmers typically don't consider themselves to be beef producers, but they should. And According to FarmBench, FarmBench is the newer version of AGFA. So if you've used AGFA, FarmBench is what it's kind of branded as now. Uh, market cows sold for slaughter, cows sold from slaughter from dairies, make up about 6.6% of total farm sales. So in a dairy of about 250 cows, we'll use as an example, that could be potentially 60 to $100,000 per year on that dairy. Market cows create opportunities on the farm. They free up space for the younger cows. We know the youngest cows in the herd have the best genetic potential, best genetic value. We're bringing in younger animals into the herd and making space for them. So we need to, of course, remove older cows that maybe aren't living up to their potential in the herd in the barn. We have reduced labor from removing those inefficient animals from the herd. We are saving on feed from those inefficient cattle once we remove them from the herd and our resource savings are improved as well for medication, semen, bedding, and you can even consider buildings as part of your resource savings as well. Cows that leave the herd, they leave under two different categories, voluntary and involuntary. The voluntary calls are milk production levels, they're being called because of the milk production levels or reproduction. Involuntary, lameness, mastitis, injury, or other illness. These are things that they essentially can't control and we can't control as well. When we look at the cows being sold for slaughter out of the dairy, the majority of the issues, the reasons they are leaving the herd is because of poor production, utter mastitis problems, reproductive problems, or lameness and injury. We'll talk a little bit more about disease on the next slide. And aggressiveness, we don't see that very often in dairy cattle. Once in a while, we run into them. If we were looking at a pie chart of beef cattle, this would be there'd be quite a bit more aggressive cattle being called for that reason or sold for that reason. Looking at the health reasons why animals leave the herd, 36% surprisingly, cancer eye, displaced abomasum, 20%. They are down for at least 24 hours. And this is a situation where they're not leaving the herd by being shipped to market. They're leaving the herd because they are being euthanized. Those cows, as we know, cannot get on a trailer, they cannot be sold for market. Lameness, a uh, lame cow certainly can still walk. We'll talk a little bit more about whether or not they should be getting on a trailer and for other reasons as well. So there are two things here, cancer eye. These animals should not be getting on a trailer. If they have cancer eye, and we don't see that very much in dairy cattle, not as much as we would see in beef cattle that spend a lot of their time out on the range with the white faces especially those cows are susceptible to it. And we know that if they have cancer eye, if it is a visible cancerous tumor on the cow's face, that animal should not be getting on a trailer because we know that cancer can travel through the body. And if it has cancer on its face, it could potentially have cancer in other places in the body. And you're risking that cow of going to slaughter and being condemned. Displaced abomasum, that is another interesting topic because when that cow has a displaced abomasum, that's something that could be easily remedied with some intervention. And rather than dealing with a cow having a surgery, a quick surgery and getting that fixed, these farmers are choosing to put these cows on a trailer, potentially a situation where that cow is going to be in pain and uncomfortable and um, maybe just not in the best shape for transportation uh, going for the next couple of days until she's processed. 
market cows. The average dairy cull rate in the U.S. is 33%. Dairy cattle are estimated to contribute about 20 to 25% of the U.S. beef market. So there are quite a bit of these market dairy animals going to slaughter that are getting used in our everyday meat products. Market Dairy cattle provide much more than ground beef. I've heard it a million times. Well, they're all just going to be ground beef in the end. That's definitely not the case. And according to the 2012 Beef Quality Assurance Audit, 75% of cull, cow, and or bull carcasses are used for whole cuts, specifically rear leg round cuts. So we call them rounds. That's the back leg, uh, everything from the hip pins, excuse me, the hips and pins down to that back joint, her back uh, hock, uh, that muscle in there, that's a really important piece of muscle on a dairy cow because when we look at a dairy cow, there's not a lot of muscle on those animals. And that's one of the biggest, most important pieces of muscle on that animal. These are two things I, that stuck in my head as I was sitting at a table with a farmer, uh, not the same farmer, these aren't the same quotes from the same farmer, but two different places. And the one that really stuck in my head is she didn't bleed out, so I guess we got lucky. So that means they were putting a cow on the trailer that they completely expected to not make it to the slaughter plant. That is not what we should be doing. It's not in your best interest to be putting a cow on that trailer in that shape. It certainly isn't in her best interest. It's just not the thing we want to be doing now to be a responsible, good producer. And the other one was, I can't believe that one wasn't condemned. Again, they're putting an animal on the trailer they know isn't something that should be leaving the farm in that condition. And when you think about it morally, are you doing the right thing? Are you doing the right thing for that cow? The other thing we want to just kind of address here is when you put a cow in the trailer, would you be willing to put your name on the side of the cow like that, like I have in this photo? Would you be willing to put your name on that cow? So everybody from when you put her on the trailer all the way to when she arrives at the packing plant, everybody sees that name and that phone number. Is that a cow you would be happy knowing that other people know exactly where she came from. Think about that. Just kind of think about that when you're putting a cow in a trailer. And that's where we move into fitness for transport. Fitness for transport is something we, we need to address when we look at these cows when they're leaving the farm. Is this an animal that can get on the trailer? Is she going to stay? be able to manage this trip. Transport is very stressful. Mingling with new cattle, there are long periods of standing. We could go back to that one slide where we had about 15% of the cows are lame. So when they're lame, the first thing they want to do is lay down, right? There's not always room for them to move and lay down. The food and water deprivation is an issue. They're on a trailer. There's certainly not water on there. And they're definitely not being fed. They're in unfamiliar handling practices, new people. They don't know these people. They don't really understand what's going on. Engorged udders. This is a really easy thing to fix. Before you put a cow on a trailer to be shipped to go wherever she's going, just milk her. That's all you got to do. Even if you're dumping the milk, it doesn't matter. Milk that cow before she leaves. It's a, a big uh, relief for that animal. If you're going to make the trip, just because they're going to slaughter doesn't mean they need to suffer injury during shipping that happens that's certainly not something you, you're responsible for but this this does happen uh, quite often they're in pain a lot of them were as we saw that one pie chart there's a lot of injury there some of those cows are injured and or suffering with pain whether it be their DAs or whatever issues they have going on. Illness, extreme weather. I live right outside of Green Bay. I was in Green Bay on Monday and uh, there's a couple of really big packing plants in Green Bay. And I was sitting at a gas station and I saw a trailer go by. It was heading up the road to the packing plant and all of the vents on the side of the trailer were open. And I don't know what the temperature was on Monday, but it probably wasn't much better than it is today. And it was probably around zero. And I imagine it was really, really cold in that trailer for those cows. So on the other end, in the middle of July, I could probably be sitting at that same gas station and it could be 100 degrees. So we really need to consider these cows are dealing with extreme weather and calving. And this one, quite honestly, it's really surprised me coming from a dairy farm where I know my dad would never put a pregnant cow on a trailer that was so close to calving. I worked at this packing plant outside of Milwaukee for some time in my um, early career, and 
I saw calves come off the trailer with cows almost every day. And this, it sort of baffles me that somebody would put a cow in a trailer that is that close to, to calving. Just let mm-hmm. that cow calve at home before you put her on the trailer. <laughs> if you got to ship her after she calves, it's better than subjecting that cow to that very stressful event on a trailer, let alone having that calf being born on the trailer and potentially being injured or killed just because of the crowded conditions on the trailer. Fitness for transport, moving on a little bit here. The American Association of Bovine Practitioners has developed a set of guidelines to determine fitness for transport, and every farm should establish a set of standards with their herd managers and veterinarian, and that does result in marketing the best cow possible. We'll talk about this a little more, but cows leaving the herd should be insured her welfare until harvest. So it is your responsibility as a producer, as somebody who's putting a cow on a trailer to make sure that she makes it, you're putting the best cow on the trailer that is going to get to market. Fitness for transport, as a dairy farmer, most of you have at least had some taste of this through the Responsible Management Program, Farmers Assuring Responsible Management, the Farm 4.0 program, and as beef producers have probably gone through beef quality assurance at your local equity barn as they are requiring that now for the majority of their people who are selling All cows sent to market should be in sound and good health, and this is determined by the caretakers, the transporters, and the auditors. This is subjective, but there is a set of standards they all should be following. The termination, while subjective, is still pretty standard. Can she make it? Can she not make it? Physical health of a cow impacts her ability to manage this trip. Market cattle are mixed with animals from there are hundreds of other farms in unfamiliar surroundings, and the 2016 National Beef Quality Assurance Audit states market cows and bulls arriving at processing plants nationwide on average were in transit for 6.7 hours with a few loads over 24 hours. And that means in transit and not in holding facilities. So that's on a trailer with no water and no food. There is a transport law, 28 hour law it's called, it came out in 1994 and livestock may not be be confined in a trailer in transport for more than 28 consecutive hours without unloading the animals for feeding, water and rest. The holding time at sale barns varies, it depends and transport to slaughter facilities is usually scheduled. Again, with the slaughter facilities in Green Bay, there's a big gas station not too far from one of them. And there's always trailers parked. These one, you know, these big cattle double-decker trailers parked there overnight. And I can almost guarantee if you go there and peek in those trailers during the night, they're empty. Packing plants do not want those trailers sitting there overnight and they actually send people down to the gas stations around in the area just to check and make sure those trailers are empty because they don't want those animals sitting overnight in a trailer. They'd much rather have them in one of their barns with water and somewhere comfortable to lay down. And then the NAMI, the North American Meat Institute Transportation Audit Tool has criterion for acceptable wait times to unload, requiring a wait time less than 60 minutes. That's definitely not always the case. Sometimes for whatever reason, there's a chain reaction basically because a packing plant is a chain reaction. If something happens in the chain, anywhere in that chain while they're cutting or saws go down or something happens, way down the line, everything gets backed up. So all the way out to those animals sitting out in trailers in the parking lot. Sometimes it's longer than it needs to be. Sometimes it's just unavoidable, but they're shooting for less than 60 minutes waiting in the parking lot to get unloaded compromise cattle make unloading difficult and time consuming so when we're putting lame cattle on a trailer or you know animals that are having trouble moving or for whatever reason maybe went down during the trip those animals really do make it difficult and then those compromised cattle they put them in the back of the trailer if they know there's an animal that's kind of iffy they're going to go in the back here depending on how big the animals are you can fit three or four cows back here in this part of the trailer. So they are the first ones to unload, but if something does happen, it takes a little bit of time to get those off. And then you have the upper and lower decks here, plus the nose to unload. And that is going to take a little bit of time. So talking about who and what you're putting on the trailer. 
we have opportunity risk with cattle with farming in general and 40 40 to 50 percent of the cows market cows that end up here in the back barn of a sale barn were at one point probably sick or injured at the time of sale like we said with the pie chart to go back a little bit there about 40 for 40 to 50 percent of those cows were sick or injured and possibly treated we've heard this a million times you need to follow the standards. You need to observe those withdrawal times. Things kind of make things complicated sometimes. And with dairy farmers specifically, they're really super careful about making sure there isn't anything in their milk, but they're, they maybe don't think about it as much when they're thinking about meat. They don't consider meat their primary thing, which is why they need to consider themselves beef producers. Dairy cows were found to have three times the rate of antibiotic residue compared to their beef counterparts. So that's a big deal. But sometimes they overestimate the weight of a cow for treatment. So they maybe think that this cow is really 1,800 pounds when she's only 1,300 pounds, for instance. Cows have a slower metabolism. So if we give an injection, some kind of medication to a cow, potentially she just can't metabolize it and get it out of her system as fast as if she were a little bit healthier. This also happens when we use off-label or extra-label treatment. Some residues, I'll use banamine for instance, that has been known to hang out and stay in that liver for 18 to 24 months, sometimes longer. And it's because route of injection or route of administration for banamine is intravenous and people are giving it intramuscular. There's a lot of things that it's really, really important to follow those labels and make sure that we're doing the best we can as a meat producer. Uh, our audit again here showed that dairy cattle have twice as many rear injection lesions than beef cattle. I put a couple of carcasses here. These are both beef carcasses. However, this is a very, very, very lean dairy steer here on the left. And this is what a dairy carcass looks like if we were going to look at a dairy cow. Not much fat, lots, lots of lean, super lean muscle, bones. There's bones right under this. Uh, typically, the fat is yellow just because they're on a higher grain diet than typically steers are. And, uh, you know, you can see there's not a lot of muscle compared to this beef carcass. There's lots of muscle and a lot more fat. Dairy cattle have over twice as many rear injection -like lesions. As I said, lesions occur in the high value rear leg and must be cut out and discarded from an already light muscled animal. I, again, worked at a packing plant. I saw a lot of dairy cows, dairy carcasses go by where the entire rear leg was removed and they were hanging from another piece of the body. They could get a, a hook in it because they just had to remove the entire rear leg. So when you're removing that entire rear leg out of a dairy cow, you're really removing a big chunk of the muscle that cow has, which isn't very much. Bruising occurred in 64% of cow carcasses and must be cut away and discarded. And bruising typically happens within the last 24 hours before harvest. Again, some of this isn't your, your issue as a dairy producer, but at the same time, it's also, you know, it could have happened when she was getting on the trailer at your farm. It could have happened 10 minutes before she was slaughtered, but it's your responsibility all the way to the end. Carcass considerations, farm management practices with milk cows have important implications in her second career. This is what we want to think about as her second career. She's a beef cow now. She is a beef cow from the beginning, from when she's a very tiny baby calf, but now this is reality and she is in her second career. 90% of dairy cows are too light muscled, which is sort of funny when we think about dairy cows. Of course, they're too light muscled, but we are talking about dairy cows. They're not expecting a lot from dairy cows, but they are expecting something. And our average body condition score on a dairy cow is 2.3, which is too lean. They don't want them that lean. When you put a little bit of condition on a cow, she's going to put on some muscle. When you think about how big a dairy cow's ribeye is, you know, if you look at the palm of your hand, it's smaller than that. When we're talking about smaller than a pork chop and it's not shaped like a pork chop, which is nice and round. It's kind of like a triangle. There's not a lot of muscle there. Bruising, is, again, is on 64% of those cow carcasses. So here's a dairy cow in a two- body condition score. It's too lean. Uh, we look at this and we think this dairy cow, she's a dairy cow. She doesn't look too bad, actually. She's too lean. She is in a negative en energy balance. This cow is probably milking a lot, 
but if she's in a negative energy balance, that means she's losing weight every day. She's putting all as much as we can, at least as much as we hope she will, put a lot of her energy she's taking in every day and putting that into making milk. But it's important to maintain that body condition too. How do you improve what you have? How do we take this two body condition score cow and make her a two and a half? Now this cow, she's not that much better. She's still got ribs showing. She still has her hips and her pins showing. But look at this rear leg compared to this cow. It's kind of concave here. This cow's got some muscle in her back leg. She's got a little bit of finish on her, a little bit of cover. And that's kind of what we're looking to see. We want to see something on these cows. Again, we're not expecting the world from them, but we need something from them. When we're talking about marketing to our buyers, you have to think about, well, maybe maybe this is a good time to talk to the sale barn and find out who's buying my cows. Where are my cows going? It's a good question to ask. And these sale barn managers, they know there are buyers out there. They know who they like to buy cattle from. When I worked at the packing plant, I was a cattle buyer. And I'll tell you what, you don't want to get burned more than a couple of times from some skunky cattle that come in and they make you look pretty bad. Uh, you want to buy the best animals you know are going to make it to market and make that company money. Go to your sale barn, ask them, who's buying my cows? Where are my cows going in the, in the most part? Because I know that I can take this cow, for instance, here, this one on the right, and take her to American Foods Group here in Green Bay, and they'd be happy to take this cow. They'd like her. And I know I can take this cow is probably maybe even a little too heavy for Abbey Land up in Abbotsford, Abbotsford area. They want the super lean cow. So it depends on who you're selling and who wants them and what they're going to use them for. So talking about the economics of this, you can hold potential market cows to gain weight. And I know that's hard for a dairy producer to think about because generally, if they're not making you money every day, you're thinking of this cow as wasting your time, wasting your money, wasting your resources. But she could potentially make you money in a month if you hang on to her. So cows do get the greatest rate of gain from between 28 to 56 days. So if you start giving her a little bit extra feed, so let's just use a cow for instance in our scenario where we have a fitness for transport issue. We have a cow who maybe is lame. I'd like to get rid of her today, but maybe if I hold her for another month, her foot is going to get a little bit better. She's open. She's not going to make me any money. I don't intend to breed this cow anymore. However, I could add a little bit of value to her. Hang on to her for another 30 days. 30 days, her foot will feel better. She'll be moving around better. She's going to bring a better price at the market. I can feed her extra refusals. It's cheap feed you're going to have to mix in some fresh stuff in there to get her to eat a little bit more. But her dry matter intake should be between two and a half to three percent of her body weight. So if you're thinking about that with that in mind, normally there should be like a, a regular cow. This is two cows, two fresh cows here in a, a dairy herd are taking in 60 to 80 percent of her diet is grain. You can expect at 80% grain, three pounds a day gain. So if we could put on this cow, maybe 50 to 75 pounds, she could look like this cow in 30 days. So why not hang on to her a little bit longer, let that foot heal because she's not fit for transport right now. Hold her for 30 days instead of euthanizing her or whatever you need to do with her and put a little bit of weight on her and focus on getting her to gain a little bit of weight. Take advantage of what you have. Cheap and plentiful corn silage. I was at a dairy farm yesterday. They have corn silage until I think they said August of 2022. They have enough feeding 4,000 dairy cows, enough corn silage to get them to August of 2022. Corn is expensive right now. Five something, I'll have to ask one of the grain people or one of the crops people on the call here today, but corn's expensive right now. Use your corn silage. Last year was a great corn silage year. Hopefully there's a lot sitting around on your farm too. Protein is plentiful. You don't need to put a ton of protein into this feed. Nine and a half to 11% of a dietary dry matter intake is adequate. 
uh, other expenses. So these are the other expenses you may, may potentially see. Medicals, utilities, fuel, 10 cents per pound of gain. And then another 45 to 50 cents per pound of gain for labor management and facilities. So we're looking at 55, 60 cents per pound. They'll make that up at the market if you get them a good cow. So this is uh, one thing, hopefully this will open up. This is a tool called economic value of a dairy cow. So this is something where you can take a cow, say for instance, so let's just kind of play around with this a little bit here. We got a, well, we got a third lactation. We'll leave that there. And let's just say she's milking right now. She's not milking very much. She's not a good cow. We're kind of thinking about it. Um, we don't know what to do with her. You can kind of play around with this one. We know this cow on our herd, in our herd right now is only $403, but maybe let's, let's do a first lactation cow. It changes. So this is something you can go into, put in your own numbers in these cells here, and it will get you a value of this cow, what her value of the cow is on in the herd right now, and potentially what her value is if you sell her as a market cow. So this is a pretty cool tool. It's kind of fun to play around with. So in summary, uh, get, your, get into this market cow mentality. Dairy farmers need to consider themselves as beef farmers. And that's really important because we, when we look at a dairy calf, we know when she's born, we want that calf to grow up and be the best milk cow we can get her to be. But we need to consider starting from day one, we're giving those injections in that the calf in the correct place. We're not giving those injections in the rear leg, quality assurance wants it in the neck. Try to cons be consistent with that. Continue to give those injections in the neck and that low value cut. Think about these calves when they're babies that someday it's going to be potentially on your dinner plate. And we want to be putting the best possible quality animal out there. So we can have the next part here is that carcass quality matters. All of the cows leaving the farm should be evaluated for fitness for transport. So we can... Uh, try to really push to get to have these animals be evaluated because if we're using this mentality where we're thinking well I sure am happy that cow didn't bleed out and die on the trailer you're not doing a good enough job of making sure this cow is fit to tr be transported market to your buyer try to figure out who your buyer is find out where your cows are going and gain pounds on your cows to gain some money.